Tony, can you introduce yourself to the people that don't that don't know who you are? Okay, yeah, you don't have to. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah, I'll just talk right to you. All right. Can you introduce yourself to the people who don't know who you are? Tell people what you do. Yeah, my name's uh, Tony Montgomery. I'm a 220-242 lifter. Um, I'm sponsored by Donuts and Deadlifts, and uh, I train up in Portland with uh, Chris Duffin at Kabuki Strength Club. You were out here in California for a while, weren't you? Yeah, I, I lived in California for about two and a half years. Uh -huh. uh, I trained with um, Dan Green at Balls Barbell, and I trained with uh, Jesse Burdick at CSA as well. And now you're up in Portland? Yeah, yeah, so just kind of like taking the next, you know, last five years and the next five years to travel and train and like learn as much as I can from the top lifters and hopefully become a, a better lifter myself. 744 on the bar for Jimmy. Jimmy giving it a go. I don't know if they're going to give that. It didn't look like he locked it out. He locked it out. Yeah. It's hard for my angle. I couldn't tell what. If he it's was just still hard with the gear in general because it covers up the elbows a little bit to see if it's fully like locked out. Yeah. Now I noticed you're competing at 242. I usually see you at 220. I actually think you look more comfortable at 242 than you do at yeah. 220. Yeah. I feel a lot better. I didn't even have to cut for this meet. To, uh, to get to that weight, and then um, I kind of just made up my mind to probably stay at 242 for a while, because I got invited to uh, Australia in March at 242, so I think I just get comfortable with that weight. I guess something happened to Jimmy. Pull something up. Might have dislocated his shoulder. I think he passed out, maybe. Brian Carroll is up, 788 on the bar. We gotta get people away from the platform for Brian. Hopefully Jimmy's all right. He might have passed out, you're right. Yeah. Blood pressure through the roof, back on his back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Brian Carroll, Brian going 788. What do you do for a living? What's that? What do you do for a living? I, right now I just do um, online training for my business, uh, TM Nutrition. So if people want to get a hold of you for training, how do they get a hold of you? They can just go to my website at uh, tmnutrition.net, and then I'm on Instagram as well, and okay. Tony Montgomery Jr. And uh, written articles for Elite FTS, and there's some articles going up for uh, Chris Duffin on his new website that's coming out. Awesome. Brian going 788. Oh, smoke that. Easy, huh? Good look. Yeah, he does. It's, like a, it's a whole different sport when you watch the, the yeah, lifters. It's, yeah, it's a whole different sport. Yeah, so it's even it's hard to just compare the two. Right. That's why I just like just split it up. And, like this is geared lifting, leave it alone, and then raw lifting. But definitely because respect the heck out of those guys to be able to just manage that weight. Yeah, and yeah. just because you put the gear on doesn't mean that. If you're strong raw, that you can it just translates over. You gotta relearn how to lift. Yeah, exactly. You gotta learn the gear inside and out. You know, and you gotta learn the weight process. If you get too big, recomping, then you blow out of your gear. If you get too small, then it doesn't fit right. Right. To me, that's just too much. There's enough variables with just racks and uh, weight and stuff to tinker with that other stuff. Not really something I'd ever want to venture into. Tony Pelzer going to 8:32. It's a lift off for Tony. Doesn't look like he's going to get it to touch. It almost looked like his elbow was flaring back, and he couldn't he couldn't get his stomach up to get the bar to his his belly. So he, that's too bad. You can bomb out so easy as a gear lifter. Yeah, yeah. It's just because uh, it's just small, small details, right? right? Right. I've never messed with it, so I don't really know. But I can only imagine like little minute right. changes and stuff. If you don't tuck too hard, if you don't do something, it can completely just throw you off. Yeah. Whereas like in, in raw lifting, I still feel like even if you do mess up, you can kind of grind it out a little bit. Where in gear, it just seems like if they get it, they get it. If they don't, it's, it's not even close. Do you say you're training up in Portland right now? Yeah, I train in Portland with uh, at Kabuki Lab. Is that downtown Portland or is it a little? It's um, that's in Clackamas, so it's like southeast Portland. Southeast. Portland. Yeah. 
Now, of all the guys that you've been around, all these guys that you've worked for or worked with, trained with, who's been the one that's left the biggest impact on you so far? Um, good. I, I don't want to say bad, but who's the one that you, you can take the most away from that's really, really brought you into your own now? Yeah. I... I mean, from each one I learned something very different, you know. They're all um, different people. Yeah, I learned more from just watching Dan, how he conducts himself and trains and like competes. The mindset that he has, that was completely different than anything I've ever seen before. And then when I went to CSA and trained with Jesse, um, I learned more how to like be a good coach. Because he's a really good coach, hands on and stuff. Good people person. Yeah, he's a very good people person. And then um, with Chris, Chris is very technical and he does a lot of uh, movement stuff. So just learning the finer details of grabbing the ground, bracing, breathing properly, that's that's what he's teaching me right now. No lift for Glenn. Glenn going for a thousand. Looks like he just rolled out of his hand. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some some people would like that as a total, let alone a freaking bench press. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, I don't understand why the shirt's not, like, fully closed. You know, it I, just kind of hangs out in the back. Yeah, the, a lot of the multi-ply guys, they have the open back and the straps because of, of the material, because it's a canvas material. Okay. So they can't get the shirt over their back, so they can't use their back. Yeah, yeah. Trying to get the compression into their chest and their shoulders, because you know, I mean, the bench press is so critical that your upper back gets tight when you drive with your back. Yeah. And I think the way shirts used to be made, now the way shirts are made now, they're allowing benchers to use their backs again. Okay, I got you. The old Enzer Blast shirt, the cheap $20, $40 shirt, would just compress it so much you couldn't use your upper back. Yeah. And even a guy sense. like that that's, you know, 350 pounds, there's no way he's slipping into his shirt. Yeah, yeah. We're on third attempts to complete the flight. So how long have you been at it? When did you start lifting? Um, I've been powerlifting for like, three years now. What were you doing before powerlifting? Uh, I, was, I did strongman for six, and then I was in the military for four. And were then you, uh, high school you, football. So. Were you training? Were you lifting weights when you were playing high school football and in the military? Yeah, and during high school I lifted weights, um, just kind of more bodybuilding style. And then in the military, I found out about, um, when I was in Fallujah, I started doing some research, found out about Joe DeFranco and Elite FTS. Yeah. So then I started training more conjugate style um, during the military. And then uh, then we just started doing more CrossFit too, because so I was with the Recon Special Forces guys. Yeah. So we got, started doing a lot more CrossFit. And then uh, once I got out of that, I went back to conjugate for Strongman. And then once I was done with Strongman, I pretty much just stick to more or less like the, the set principle when it comes to the Royal Powerlifting and stuff. Sam going for a third attempt to 292. Oh no, she flattened out. Hopefully she's all right. So obviously you didn't just wake up and become a 500-pound a bench press. You had to work at it. Uh, you know, not knowing you was a lifter, but was the bench press a lift of the three lifts that you were just better at naturally? Yeah, I've always been a pretty good bench press. Always benched over 400, right? Yeah, and it's taken me a while to uh, to build up my squat, and uh, I've always had a good bench and a good deadlift. My deadlift seemed to stall, my squat's picking up now, my bench is, is picking up gradually, so I guess what makes me a good bencher also makes me like a semi-bad deadlifter. It always seems that one lift is always lagging, right? Yeah, yeah, You're always happy with one, kind of so-so with another, and then you're just like, man, this lift really sucks right now. Yeah. Here's Andy going for 292. So you've lifted in a lot of federations. Do you like the way this one's gone so far? Yeah, I like it. I like the fact that there's uh, some different di judges from different uh, federations. And, um, you know, I, I prefer the, the stricter judging over the other stuff. The more sure. of the USBA. More USBA, yeah. Like the judges they'll bring to the LA Fit Expo or to 
uh, they're worlds, they're international judges. Yeah, which, yeah. So try to hold the lifters to a, to the same standard, a very high standard. Yeah, and they seem to be more consistent too. That's the biggest thing as a, as a judge. Like finding the consistency is what matters the most, right? Because if there's a judge that calls one too high when it's low, and then calls one good when it's high, then you just don't really know where you're at, you know. And it's hard to get. It's hard for you to get. You know, you would tell somebody you're training, just get as deep as you can, but you get to a point where you just go so deep and you drive your knees out that your hips buckle and yeah. your knees buckle. Yeah, there's a point of no return where your butt dips down, your knees buckle in, and, you know, it's, it's definitely finding that, like, good line, you know, and I feel like if you don't do the other federations, you're never really going to know kind of where the standards are, you know? There's Liz Friel going 352. 160 kilos for Liz. Liz weighed in at 160 pounds body weight. And obviously she's battling some things right now. Yeah, yeah. Like she I just said. did a, her deadlift only mean for 501, I believe. Yeah. yeah. She's incredible. Yeah, yeah. No excuse with her. No, none at all. We'll see what she does. It's like she didn't have it where she wanted it. Yeah. There she is. Oh, whoa. Good save. Great catch. Yeah, really good save. Great catch. It just looked like it was a bad, bad from the start, you know? Like she never could really retract her shoulders back. She no. kind of started off and she really didn't like where it was. Yeah. But she's but. such a warrior. Yeah, she is. We'll never see another female lifter like her. Yeah. That's it though, those third attempts, it's those, those little details that either make or break the lift. Yeah, I mean, is it, having the shirt too low or the shirt too high, having your straps up too high, too low, it could manipulate the body. Like you said, it's already hard enough without all that crap. Yeah, exactly. You get a guy like Jimmy Pacifico who squatted over a thousand, and then he's trying to bench low to mid sevens, it's like, you know, you're already messing with your blood pressure and your yeah. body and you're handling weights that you wouldn't be handling without the gear. It's yeah, already yeah. dangerous. It's like driving a race car, you know, into a turn. Right. And having to cut the wheel at the right time. Yep, yeah, exactly. Here's Greg going 540. Good lift for Greg. No Jimmy Pacifico. Nope. Marcus Wild then Jimmy Pacifico and Brian Carroll. So going forward after this meet, what's uh, what's next for you? Um, I want to do. I'm gonna do a next meet and sleep. So the rest of the year is just gonna be sleep training, just kind of get uh, my squat up more. So then next year in March. I go to Australia for the uh, Pro Row or the Raw Pro or Pro Raw. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then, uh, so this year I'm just trying to find a meet to do in sleeves right around like September, November time frame. Something you can do to kind of tune up for it. So that again? You, you want to tune up for it, right? So if you want to squat 700, let's say in, in next March, you would go to squat like 677 or would you take a shot to 700 right. to get your confidence yeah exactly the big meet is obviously the one in march so yeah. everything else is just kind of setting itself up for that so if i can squat seven in sleeves then i should be able to squat 70 800 and wraps Absolutely. come march yeah so just kind of getting like a good baseline to start building um for the meat prep in uh march marcus wild going 617 Like you got it. Nice. Good look. So talking about your bench press, if you could do it all over again, would you have taken a smaller jump before you went to 500? You're not 474, right? Yeah, it's 474 than 501. Would you, looking back now, would you second have guessed it at all? No, because that's that's how I've been doing it in training. Yeah. Taking bigger jumps. Like 25 um, pound jumps. Yeah, I've taken. Uh, Usually I go 445 and then I'll do um, 474 and then I did 501, 
and then um, like three weeks out, I hit 512 after 480. So, so you were thinking maybe like a 524 today or 518? Yeah. That's what I was expecting, but um, I just gotta go back and figure out what went wrong. This week, I did something. I just took the whole week off. You think and that you just got too restless? I think so, because you know my legs started to feel heavy. Like my body felt heavy, not necessarily so much the, the weight per se. So. I think um, I've done it a few ways. I've done it training into the meat heavy, and I've done it where it's like a deload, and then this week I took off, and I feel the most comfortable kind of going heavy into the meat. I think so, like you're peaking up for it, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's the way um, that's the way I learned with uh, with Dan at Boss, is that that's how he does it, and that's when I've had the most successful meets. Not necessarily, I wasn't, I wasn't at my strongest at the time, but that's when I went like eight for nine and seven for nine at meets, so. I think I'm just gonna stick with that. I just thought that as I gotten stronger, I would need more rest, and it just seems to not be the case. So your body likes training at a, at a, a more frequent level. So yeah, because I, I usually train at a higher higher frequency anyways. I'll squat two to three times a week, and then I'll pull twice a week and bench twice a week. So now will you squat and pull on the same day, or how yeah. does that look? Okay, so you squat and pull, and then the next day probably train chest, take a day off. Squat, pull again, train chest again? I usually do, um, Monday I'll do squat and then practice deadlifts and then um, Tuesday I'll do back, Wednesday bench, Thursday off, Friday deadlifts and then squats and then Saturday bench. Now will you work different types of squats? Like safety bar or camber bar? Or In the off season, yeah. In the off season I'll do more um, high bar, close stand, safety squat bar stuff. Stuff to really work on my weaknesses. Yeah. Right around like eight to ten weeks out, I'll do everything as specific as possible to the meat and kind of linear progress into the meat. Brian, eight ten on the bar for Brian. Brian getting some, looks like some spray chalk on his feet. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen anybody do that before. I've never seen that before. And I've seen the chalk on the back and the chalk on the butt, but I've never seen a spray on the on the shoes. Yeah. Let's we'll see if we can we'll see if we can see what happens here. Eight ten, three sixty-seven point five kilos. Oh, man. I thought for sure, as soon as he got it down, it was going to come off like a rocket, but it was the opposite. Yeah. As soon as he got it down, he just lost it. See, I don't know. For me, like, just being able to know, like, it's me handling the weight, even if something goes wrong, it just feels better for me, you know? I've seen way more catastrophic injuries in Multiply than I have in, in Royal Lifting. Yeah. Now, do you think that there's anything to the statement raw lifting is causing more injuries now than gear lifting or do you think that the raw lifters that are hurt that are really banged up the guys you hear about on social media they're banged up just because of not training properly i think i think a lot of the, the raw lifters that are getting hurt now they do too much specificity the whole year so they're just working the same the same movement patterns, so you just get a lot of wear and tear. So if you're a wide squatter and you squat wide all year, your hips are gonna get beat up, you know, and then same thing with benching. So I think they just do too much specificity in the off season when they don't have meets coming up. And that's probably why you see a lot of the reoccurring injuries in, in raw lifters right now. 8.59, Vittori, 390 kilos. Man. It just happened so fast. Yeah. It's a split, split second. Yeah. I, I, I think there's something to that because I hurt my my chest and shoulder and I don't know how I did it because one day everything was fine. A week later I went to bench and, and 
I was having a hard time locking it out. It felt like my pec and shoulder were going to tear away, so I had to keep my arms sucked in. Then I had to bring my grip in the next week. Yeah. And, then it, and then it went from so deep that it, it came all the way up to the surface that I was starting having problems bringing it to my chest and coming off. So I said, you know what, I'm going to take a week off. So I took a week off. I asked uh, Steve Goggins, I said, Steve, you know, I don't know what to do. My thought process is high reps, just cut the weight back in high reps. Said, yeah, give it a shot. So I came in and I did 135, four sets of 10, the next week 155, and I got my hands on a duffalo bar. Yeah. And I went 175, 195, and then three weeks later made it up to 205 for sets of 10. And you know, I could barely bring the bar to my chest. And then this week I get 215 for... I get 215 for 10, and then I go on. I ended up just going over 300, and I realized that tra changing the bar and changing my hand position, because I had to kind of go out a little bit wider than I normally do, yeah. it not only kind of hit a different area on my pack, but it allowed me to still bench again. And it, it almost like I was so damn sore from all the reps, I brought fresh nutrients to the area that was damaged. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean... Just, it doesn't have to be like huge variations, right? So if you're normally benching with a pause, uh -huh. you can go close grip, touch and go. You know, you don't have to do boards with chains right. to make it uh, not a very specific, um, you know, change. So still want a very specific, but not the same movement patterns. That's just my opinion. Why I've seen a lot of guys get hurt. Yeah, I agree. And I think I got hurt because I had been benching the same way for a year, you know, just constantly going up and then coming down and going up. Yeah, throwing the slingshot on, going up, throwing the slingshot on, going down. Um, floor presses, photo presses. I, I think I was doing too much of pressing with the bar, and I aggravated something deep, some deep, uh, uh, my connected tissue or something. Yeah. And I thought, I'll just take a week off, I'll give it rest. And then I take a week off, and it's, there's no change. So I said, well, I'm not taking a week off. I'm just going to rep through this thing. Yeah. And with the duffalo bar, I was telling people in my gym in Tucson where I live, I said, that bar, it almost like it it activated some muscles and recruited some new muscles to yeah. get involved. Well, the way Chris the way Chris bent it and the way he made it is when you grab it, your, your shoulder socket sits a lot better and your hand placement's a lot better, so it's a lot less stress on your shoulder joint. So you do get the extra range of motion without the stress like a normal buffalo bar. So he has it curved a certain way just for that particular reason. Now, have you squatted with it and benched with it yourself? Yeah, I've done both. Yeah. Do you like it? Are you a big yeah. fan of it? I like I like it um, because you can still put it pretty low because the knurling and the way it's bent. So you can get it low and it kind of hits your whole back, whereas the buffalo bar, you would have to have it a little bit higher because it wouldn't hit your back the way it was curved. So it's a good way for people to transition from high bar to low bar without banging up their elbows. Yep. And it's a good way to build up your chest and bench press without banging your shoulders up a lot. I completely agree. I'm so I'm so happy he did that, that he yeah. made that bar. You know, he's such a smart guy. I'm glad that he's done things like that. Yeah, yeah he's putting a lot of new stuff out there right now with um, his website's kabuki.ms. It's a movement website yeah. where he's going over all the body tempering, all the movement patterns, all the breathing and bracing to kind of prevent any injuries from happening before they before you start training and stuff so that's the biggest thing with him is he's more of a movement guy right so if you have proper movement patterns you should never get hurt you should never get tight if you think about you know as a baby you're able to squat and do everything and then as you get older and start lifting is when you start to get stiffer is when you start to not be able to have all you have all these mobility problems and that's probably because 90 percent of the time we're doing bad movement patterns to create those issues right right yeah. So again, if people want to get a hold of you and reach out to you for training, what's your website again? It's at tmnutrition.net. Okay. Yep. I appreciate your time. I appreciate man. it. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good yep. luck to you for the rest of the meet. Thank you. Yep.